Chapter 13. It must have been a Sunday morning when the corporal told us to take the day off training. He tapped the palm of his hand with the flat edge of his bayonet. If you are religious, I mean a Christian, worship your Lord today because you might not have another chance. Dismissed. We went to the square wearing our army shorts and the craps that had been given to us. We started a soccer game, and as we played, the lieutenant came out to sit on the veranda of his house. We stopped the game and saluted him. Carry on with the game. Right now I want to see my soldiers play soccer. He sat on the stoop and began reading Julius Caesar. When we were done with soccer, we decided to go to the river for a swim. It was a sunny day, and as we went down to the river, I felt the cool breeze drying the sweat on my body. We played swimming games for a few minutes, then divided into two teams for an ambush game. The first group to capture all the members of the other group would win. Let's go, soldiers. The holiday's over, the corporal called us from the banks of the river. We stopped our playing and followed him to the village. As we jogged to catch up with him, we jokingly tripped and pushed each other into the bushes. At the village, we were asked to quickly service our AK-47s. As we cleaned our guns, backpacks, and waste packs were distributed among us. Two crates of ammunition were set out, one containing loaded magazines and the other loose bullets. The corporal commanded us to each take as much ammunition as we could carry. Don't take too much, though. We want you to be able to run fast, he said. As I loaded my backpack and waist pack, I looked up and saw that some of the older soldiers were doing the same. My hand began to shake and my heart beat faster. All the other boys, except for Alhaji, were having fun because they thought we were going to be gearing up for more drills. But I knew we weren't going for training, and Alhaji leaned on the wall of the building, clutching his gun like a mother would hold her baby. He knew it too. Stand up on your feet, soldiers, the corporal said. He had left us briefly to change. He was fully dressed in army uniform and carried a backpack and waist pack full of ammunition. He held a G3 weapon and his helmet under his arms. We stood in line for inspection. All of the boys wore army shorts and green t-shirts. The corporal handed us green head ties and said, if you see anyone without a head tie of this color or a helmet like mine, shoot him. He screamed the last two words. Now it was clear that we weren't going for training. As we tied our head claws, Sheku, standing next to me, fell backward. He had too m taken too much ammunition. The corporal emptied some of the magazines from his backpack and stood him up. Sheku's forehead was sweating and his lips trembled. The corporal patted him on the head and continued talking. The other men, he pointed to the older soldiers, will carry spare boxes of ammunition, so do not overload yourselves. Now relax, we'll be on our way in a few minutes. The corporal walked away. We sat down on the ground, and everyone seemed to wander into their thought, wander into their own thoughts. The daily bird songs were gone, replaced now by the rising of firing levers at the older soldiers readied themselves. Sheku and Josiah sat next to me, their eyes watery and dull. All I could do was rub their heads to assure them it might be okay. I got up and walked over to Alhaji and the rest of my friends. We made a pact that no matter what, we would try and stay together. A young soldier came by with a plastic bag full of some kind of tablets. They looked like capsules, but they were plain white. He handed them to each of us with a cup of water. The corporal said this will boost your energy, the soldier announced with a secretive smile on his face. As soon as we had taken the tablets, it was time to leave. The adult soldiers led the way. Some carried, box, uh, carried ammunition boxes, the length of two cement bricks between them, and others had semi-automatic machine guns and RPGs. I held my AK-47 with my right hand, its mouth pointing to the ground. I had attached an extra magazine with adhesive tape to one side of the gun. I had lifted my bayonet on my left hip with some magazines and loose bullets in my side pack. In my backpack, I had more magazines and loose bullets. Josiah and Sheku dragged the tip of their guns as they still weren't strong enough to carry them, and the guns were taller than they were. We were supposed to come back that evening, so we carried no food or water. There are lots of streams in the forest, said the lieutenant said, walking away, leaving the corporal to finish what he had started. It's better to carry more ammunition than food and water, because with more ammo, we'll be able to find food and water. But with more food and water, we will not make it to the end of the day, the corporal explained. The women and older people in the village stood on their verandas and watched as we were led away by the adult soldiers into the clearing towards the forest. A baby cried uncontrollably in its mother's arms, as if he knew what lay ahead of us. The sun's brightness painted our shadows on the ground. I have never been so afraid to go anywhere in my life as I was that day. Even the scuttle of a lizard frightened my entire being. A slight breeze blew and it went through my brain with a sharp swoop that made me grit my teeth in pain.
Tears had begun to form in my eyes, but I struggled to hide them and grip my gun for comfort. We walked into the arms of the forest, holding our guns as if they were the only thing that gave us strength. We exhaled quietly, afraid that our own breathing would cause our own death. The lieutenant led the line that I was in. He raised his fist in the air and we stopped moving. Then he slowly brought it down and we sat on one heel, our eyes surveying the forest. I wanted to turn around and see my friends' faces, but I couldn't. We began to move swiftly among the bushes until we came to the edge of a swamp, where we formed an ambush, aiming our guns into the swamp. We lay flat on our stomachs and waited. I was lying next to Josiah. Then there was Sheku and an older adult soldier between myself, Juma, and Musa. I looked around to see if I could catch their eyes, but they were concentrated on the invisible target in the swamp. The top of my eyes began to ache and the water and pain slowly rose up to my head. My eyes began warm and tears were running down my cheeks, even though I wasn't crying. The veins in my arms stood out and I could feel them pulsating as if they had begun to breathe on their own accord. We waited in the quiet as hunters do, our fingers gently caressing the triggers. The silence tormented me. The short trees in the swamp began to shake as the rebels made their way through them. They weren't yet visible, but the lieutenant had passed the word down through a whisper that was relayed like a domino effect. Fire on my command. As we watched, a group of men dressed in civilian clothes emerged from under some tiny bushes. They waved their hands and more fighters came out. Some were boys, as young as we were. They sat together in line, waving their hands, planning a strategy. The lieutenant ordered an RPG to be fired but the commander of the rebels heard it as it whooshed its way through the forest. Retreat, he told his men, and the grenade's blast only got a few of men whose split bodies flew in the air. The explosion was followed by an exchange of fire from both sides. I lay there with my gun pointed in front of me, unable to shoot. My index finger had become numb. The forest had begun to spin. I felt as if the ground had turned upside down and I was going to fall off, so I clutched the base of a tree with one hand. I couldn't think, but I could hear the sounds of guns far away in the distance and the cries of people dying in pain. I had begun to fall into some sort of nightmare. A splash of blood hit my face. In my reverie, I'd opened my mouth a bit, so I tasted some of the blood. As I spat it out and wiped my face, I saw the soldier it had come from. Blood poured out of the bullet holes in him like water rushing through newly opened tributaries. His eyes were wide open. He still had his gun. My eyes were fixed on him when I heard Josiah scream. He cried for his mother in the most painful, piercing voice that I had ever heard. It vibrated inside my head to the point where I felt that my brain had shaken loose from its anchor. The sun showed flashes of the tips of guns and bullets traveling towards us. Bodies had begun to pile up on top of each other near a short palm tree where fronds dipped blood, dripped blood. I searched for Josiah. An RPG had tossed his tiny body off the ground, and had, he, had, he had landed on a tree stump. He wiggled his legs as his cry gradually came to an end. There was blood everywhere. It seemed as if bullets were falling into the forest from all angles. I crawled to Josiah and looked into his eyes. There were tears in them, and his lips were shaking, but he could not speak. As I watched him, the water in his eyes was replaced with blood that quickly turned his brown eyes into red. He reached for my soldier as if he wanted to hold it and pull himself up, but midway he stopped moving. The gunshots faded in my head, and it was as if my heart had stopped and the whole world had come to a standstill. I covered his eyes with my fingers and pulled him from the tree stump. His backbone had shattered. I placed him flat on the ground and picked up my gun. I did not realize that I stood up to take Josiah off the tree stump. I felt someone tugging at my foot. It was the corporal. He was saying something that I couldn't understand. His mouth moved and he looked terrified. He pulled me down and as I hit the ground, I felt my brain shaking in my skull again and my deafness disappeared. Get down, he was screaming. Shoot, he said, as he crawled away from me to resume his position. As I looked to where he lay, my eyes caught Musa, whose head was covered with blood. His hands looked too relaxed. I turned to the swamp where there were gunmen were running, trying to cross over. My face, my hands, my shirt, my gun were covered with blood. I raised my gun and pulled the trigger and I killed a man. Suddenly, as if someone was shooting them inside my brain, all the massacres I had seen since the day I was touched by war began flashing in my head. Every time I stopped shooting to change magazines, I saw my two young lifeless friends and I angrily pointing my gun in, into the swamp and killed more people. I shot everything that moved until we were ordered to retreat because we needed another strategy.